Murfreesboro, Tennessee, um, co founder of the organization called Citizens to End Nuclear Dumping in Tennessee. I am speaking today primarily, however, as a mother and a grandmother. I gather that most of the people that I'm speaking to here who are scientists are in the field of physics or chemistry. And what I would like to ask you to do today is to consider these issues in terms of the biological perspective as opposed to the um, more what the word would be for that for the other branches of science. For many decades we have been warned by physicians and public health officials, people like Helen Caldicott and Dr. John Goffman and Rosalie Bertel have told us the dangers of ionizing radiation to human health. We have been told that it damages DNA and causes mutations, and that it is carcinogenic, and especially to children. Now there's no debating the issue that react, nuclear reactors do emit radiation. They, there are routine emissions, there are spills, there are accidents, some more serious than others. However, TVA and the NRC, I have yet to see a report that does not say no risk to the public after one of these things occurs. These reactors pollute the environment, the water, the air, the rain rains down radionuclides onto the grass, gets into our plants, into our food chain. There are many studies that have been done, mostly abroad, that show that people, and especially children, who live near uh, nuclear reactors have a higher incidence of cancer than the national averages or than people who live at a greater distance. Back in the 1980s, there was one by, at, at Southfield in England that found clusters of leukemia and cancer. In Germany, around the year 2010, it was a government-sponsored uh, study that showed that the reactors tested, there was uh, almost double the rate of leukemia, well, to over double the rate of leukemia and double the amount of other cancers in children. Uh, another study at Chepstow, Wales, a very recent one, shows that three and a half times the risk of cancer to children than the national average. Now just this past week, another study came out from Sacramento, that was done at Sacramento uh, County, California, where there are approximately 1.4 million people living. Rancho Seco is a reactor that has been closed for 23, over 23 years. This study shows, by going through all the cancer records of the state of California, they have shown that there is a drop of cancer incidence in the 20 years since the closing. Um, a very precise number, 4,319 fewer cases over that 20 year period. And many of these are women, Hispanics, and children. Again, children are some of the worst victims of radiation poisoning. The National Academy of Sciences is currently uh, uh, carrying on a study of reactors in this country to see whether the cancer incidence is indeed higher or not. Uh, the NRC is sponsoring that study, and it's not yet completed. Yet the NRC is going ahead with relicensing before knowing all the facts regarding human health in the vicinity of these of these plants. Now, Hamilton County contains 134,000 people. 
I'm sure there are many, many more. I'm not sure of the exact number within a 50 mile radius. I urge you not to put these people at further risk by approving a, a plant that's already reapproving, re-licensing a plant that's 40 years old, that has a poor record of operations with repeated scrams, and that has a design that has been called faulty, maybe by, not by the NRC or local people. We have all seen the horrors of somebody dying of cancer. I know I have, and it's even much worse if it happens to be a child. And I ask you please to focus on not just, our society needs to focus not just on cures for cancer, but on prevention of cancer, and this is one way that you can help do it. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Greta? And after that, Sandy Kurtz, you'll have another opportunity. I'd like to enter this into the record. This is uh, my comments and uh, supporting documents. I understand you want this into the record. I'll turn yes, it over please. to Dave. I'm sure he'll make that happen. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Greta Johnston. That's G O E T E L. And I'm with a group called Mothers Against Tennessee River Radiation. We're part of the uh, Valfine Efficiency and Sustainability <coughs> Team and the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. Uh, I come to you today, uh, first of all, I'd like to challenge a basic assumption that's in this uh, environmental report. And that is that, um, that is that the only alternative to extending this license is either to do nothing and decommission, which I would recommend, or um, to uh, the the other option is called in your uh, in your own words as the uh, reasonable alternative energy sources as an option. But the only options that are given in this uh, study are nuclear and gas powered uh, power plants. And uh, many, many studies, and I've included them in, in the literature, uh, have addressed the issue of how to replace, um, as we retire coal plants and nuclear plants, how we replace dirty energy with clean energy. And the first and foremost choice that we advocate is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency can not only replace all the power that's being generated by Sequoia at this time and quickly. It does not come online slowly, it comes online quickly and creates a lot of jobs. And it's less expensive by far than nuclear. Um, but it also uh, will improve the homes of the people of the Tennessee Valley. It will improve your lives by giving you. Uh, smaller electric bills every month, and it, as well as creating jobs and not um, fouling our nests and, and uh, putting dangerous um, radioactive poisons into our ecosystem or um, fossil fuels either. Uh, so our first line that we recommend is that this basic assumption that the only alternatives are dirty fuels um, be looked at carefully and examined and that uh, that assumption be renegotiated uh, uh, for the power plant that if in fact another option is taken that that could be renewable energy or the first line we would recommend is energy efficiency. Um, in a study by Georgia Tech and Duke University a couple of years ago, asserted that energy efficiency programs in one decade in the South alone could um, create 380,000 new jobs. That's between 2010 and 2020. 380,000 new jobs it would lower electricity bills by $41 billion. 
and all while eliminating the need for new power plants for two decades and saving 8.6 billion gallons of fresh water. And that's a major environmental concern, and if this truly is an environmental impact study, uh, I think that this has to be taken into consideration and considered as a viable modern alternative. As um, David Freeman says about the nuclear technology on TVA, he says TVA is building yesterday's technology tomorrow. And I have to agree wholeheartedly with him on that. And I want to see us looking towards the future, and especially the future of our children and grandchildren, by providing them with a clean and healthy environment to live and grow in, and uh, allowing radionuclides into our environment not only affects the food chain, but it affects our very DNA. It changes the structure of our genetic makeup. That's a long range <coughs> issue. You know, just one of these radionuclides, the power plant creates 200 when the uranium goes in, it creates 200 uh, poisons that don't exist in nature. Our body doesn't know what to do with them, so they try and find the thing that they most closely resemble, whether it be iodine or potassium or calcium, it tries to find that and it takes it up that way in the bones, in the thyroid, in different parts of the body. That's what it does with these radionuclides. And they last for a very long time. Some of them are short-lived, but we're talking about 200. And some of them are extremely long-lived. What is it, the iodine-129 lasts for, what is it, 57 million years? Is the half-life? That's 570 million years, you know, that it's dangerous. But we can't even begin to absorb what that means. But uh, it's, it's just not fair to the future of our planet, to future generations, to living beings, to um, impose this upon them. So we call, first of all, for energy efficiency. Thank you. Okay, a lot of issues have come up. Um, let me see, I think first I'll just address um, some of the ways that, uh, oops, uh -oh. before I miss anything, I need to make sure that's not on. Can y'all hear me on? Um, I would like to talk about um, a number of issues that I have concerns about that are specific to Sequoia. Some of them apply to other uh, nuclear power plants as well. Uh, one of them that is specific to Sequoia is uh, what I consider, our group considers, a uh, compromised integrity of the uh, container. And that we consider it beyond uh, the design basis of this nuclear power plant. That the uh, TBA sawed through the container, the concrete and the metal secondary container, um, of the building the reactor's in and um, took out a broken um, generator and replaced it with a giant crane. And this was not designed to be done. These, this power plant was not designed for this, so this is a beyond design basis uh, issue. And I hope that, um, that uh, the Evaluators will consider that uh, in the light of the integrity of the unit itself, but also in the light of what what it means in terms of TDA's willingness to cut into the containment structure, thereby compromising it in order to cut costs uh, to um, continue the, the nuclear program. Um, we think this is an unacceptable lack of quality control at the very least. Um, it shows a little concern for the safety and health of the uh, citizens in this area, which, by the way, someone was uh, wondering about that. Within a 50-mile radius of Sequoia, uh, there are over a uh, million people. Thanks to Pam Son, I know that. <laughs> and um, that is a, a major concern. 
Okay, another uh, deliberately fabricated beyond design basis ongoing event uh, has been mentioned earlier is this extended use of cooling pools to store the irradiated um, uh, spent, it's called spent fuel, but it's actually much more toxic than the uranium that goes into the reactors because it has been enriched in the process creating these radionuclides I talked about earlier. Um, in um, the, the Homeland Security and Congress um, asked the National Academy of Sciences to do a study on this to decide whether it was um, dangerous this overloading of the cooling pools, and uh, they recommended that all um, uh, the fuel going into these cooling pools be removed after five years and put into dry cast storage, which is considerably safer uh, for all of us. Um, the ones in Fukushima, that's a lesson of Fukushima, the dry cast storage came out unscathed. The cooling pools, we still don't know. That's what they were uh, dropping water from the helicopters to try and prevent fire at the cooling pools. Uh, according to um, a, a very well respected Robert Alvarez at the, um, I'm sorry, I forgot where he is, the Policy Institute of some sort. Anyway, um, he wrote a study in 2012 and he quoted something that I think is worth uh, re quoting. Quote, a severe pool fire, they said, uh, first let me preface it, that they, they have known for decades that severe accidents can occur in cooling pools. They've known that for decades. And he said a severe pool fire could render about 188 square miles around the nuclear reactor uninhabitable, could cause as many as 28,000 cancer fatalities and caused $59 billion in damage, according to a 1997 report for the NRC by Brookhaven National Laboratory. Um, Sequoia has well over a thousand metric tons of this highly irradiated uh, radioactive trash. And uh, it's very, very dangerous stuff. And it's stored in these coolant pools in fact, 75% of it has been piling up in this cooling pools for 30 years now. They've only moved uh, a quarter of it into dry cast storage. Now, that's a better rate than Watts Bar, which is 100% in the cooling pools, and Browns Ferry, which is 88% in the cooling pools. But basically, they're just saving a buck by keeping it in the pools and not putting it in the safer dry cast storage. Okay, that's... Um, uh, um, beyond these, uh, potential, <coughs> these um, concerns, there are potential non-deliberate, beyond design basis events such as floods or tornadoes. The TVA dams are aging and uh, they were not built to sustain uh, earthquakes in the way that the power plants were. They don't have, they don't, they're not up to those standards and they are aging. And there have been many, many failures of dams in America and uh, TDA has suffered some as well. And we, um, we were concerned that there could be um, a dam failure that could trigger a domino effect above Sequoia, and that numerous dams could break, and uh, the uh, integrity of the cooling systems could be compromised, no matter how much planning we do. As we found it in Fukushima, we cannot see everything. We are human. Okay. Um, another issue is maintenance. Um, TVA's record. Um, and I found out and, and when the tornadoes came in 2001 uh, and we had the outbreak of tornadoes in April, uh, there were uh, two of the eight backup generators that were inoperable at Brown Spelling that day. One of those EF-5 tornadoes, the strongest tornadoes known to man, um, touched down very close to Brown Spelling within visual distance. And it was um, it was a very close call because those are 
different kinds of cooling tools that are raised up in the air and all they have is overhead containment or sheet metal roofs. It's the same as Fukushima, that's what built up and you saw those roofs blow off in Fukushima, it's the same design. Okay, um, so two of those were inoperable on that day. The next day another one had to be shut down. That's three of those, that's a 40% failure rate in the back of emergency systems. And the irony of nuclear power plants is that you have to have incoming power from another source to keep them from being um, well, Pardon me. Is that me? That's not you yet. <laughs> okay. Operator so, error over so, here. <laughs> uh, so you have to have a backup power system for your power system. Uh, and that's a, that's, a sad, uh, that's a sad reality with nuclear power. And, um, okay, I want to show you something here. In, in the, I noticed in the SEIS that uh, tornadoes were mentioned, and they talked about um, their study, uh, basically, um, they, they did their statistical work around uh, two major periods. One was a 37-year period from 1950 to 1986, and there were 31 tornadoes during that period in a 34-mile radius. And uh, then the next, uh, the next period was the next 15 years up to 2002, and there were 23 tornadoes during that period. That is nearly doubling the rate in that period of time. And this only goes up to 2002. Okay, well, in 2011, as you can see, this is a NOAA track of the um, tornadoes that came through the Tennessee Valley on April 27, 2011. And uh, those circles are the 50-mile radius of our nuclear power plants in this valley, and Sequoia had um, around 15 of them, it looks like here. Uh, someone else may count it differently, but that's what it looked like to me. And I noticed in your report that you did mention that, and that TVA reported that three of them touched down within 10 miles of Sequoia. Um, your statisticians predict the unlikely odds of a direct hit on Sequoia. But I tell you, I'm not real confident with gambling on this. There are a lot of people whose lives are involved in this. And I think we need to take it seriously. And uh, I, I think what it's going to take is us demanding that the dollar not be counted above our health and safety. And um, I, of course, call for the decommissioning of uh, Sequoia. Thank you very much. Some standard parts in the area of parts associated with the Watts Bar parts issue. There is evidence of shared parts. This is a long standing issue that's been on the books since Unit 1. I was instrumental in putting this on Region 2's list in the mid 1980s. And I'm going to go through these pretty fast. So if you've got questions, you'll have to hit me up at home next week. <coughs> Treating issues for weapons for DOE and DOD are beyond the design basis, not only of Sequoia, but for Watts Bar. Sequoia was not designed for the T-bars in the numbers that are needed to produce the amount of tritium needed to fulfill the DOE contract. And why should we have a fight with Iran and North Korea for doing the same thing that we're doing here at Watts Bar and Sequoia? The number of scrams being so bad you identified them in an inspection report tells me that the stress on hardware has to be terrible. What happens to those items that crumbles and no one is looking or there is not a pre-announced happening? What about the concrete? What about the floors? What about the sirens? What about the control room? The ice condenser story knows no bounds. <coughs> the buckling floors, the sublimation, the hardware, the basket, the screws, nobody knows because nobody's mind in the store around the ice condenser. And the, we certainly know that the ice condenser was certainly not 
design to fit another 20 years, it's not going to make it another 20. So everybody needs to start getting to higher grounds. The earthen dams. Now, NRC, you're going to tell me that this only concerns Watts Bar. Watts Bar and Sequoia both are on the same reservoir. Both of them will go down if that dam at Watts Bar goes down. That allegation of a problem with the earthen dam being a problem has been on the books since the late 1980s because I was the one that put it on the books as a concern because I lived in that community. And for you to extend from the 1980s to 1998, 2004 or 5, and now here in your current inspection report, of which I'm carrying here, which is about an inch thick. Here it is. It comes to my house on a regular basis from you guys. You give them another five years to fix the, the problem. What makes you, which in effect makes NRC a party to the dangers to the hardware at both Watts Bar and Sequoia, because both emergency diesel generators, there won't be an issue. It won't even work. So we're going to do about backup electricity whenever those things go down because there was a flood in this town, in the city of Chattanooga in the mid-80s that put underwater massive amounts of this end of the state of Tennessee. Go back and look through. You can look through your history books. Go down to the local library and you'll find pictures of it because it was a major disaster. Things that had never been underwater since TVA had built their first dam was automatically underwater due to those rains. Decommissioning funds. <laughs> this is kind of like reading Bugs Bunny. Decommissioning funds. $100 million disappeared from the decommissioning funds in 2012. This is reported in the report to the SEC. So it's not my opinion. I'm still quoting from y'all's documents. At that rate, in another five years, there won't be any funds to exist because if everybody keeps pulling out $100 million and this is their uh, slush fund that they're using, which they've done it before, there won't be anything here to decommission anything, regardless accident or no accident. And remember that all of these issues have safety implications and must be in the SER, the Safety Evaluation Report. All of these items must be identified and evaluated prior to you giving a license extension. Because if they're not, that makes you and our city culpable in whatever happens. Delay in this extension will serve to show that the NRC, NRC has thrown away their rubber stamp. Now, for those of you people that live in this community and around these nuclear plants, TPA does not have any insurance to take your, take care of your problems if you have, a, there's a nuclear incident. They call, only if the reactor blows up do they call it an accident. Look for the words unplanned event and uh, unexpected. That's, it's called nuke speak. Now the only compensation from any accidents will come from the U.S. taxpayer. You're going to pay now, maybe get it later. Homeowner policies do not cover any nuclear energy issues. Do not cover any nuclear issues. Go home and read your homeowner's policy because it explicitly says this is exempt from any nuclear accident or issues surrounding them. One of the things that was a discussion here just a few minutes ago in whenever this gentleman here, whenever we had the discussion about the fire, if he would look at the February 13th inspection report on Sequoia, he would find on page, uh, it's in the summary of findings, enclosure two, on page two, one and two and three, it says they were issued a violation for failure to implement procedures required for fire protection program implementations. And the inspectors found multiple examples of where fire watches were not conducted in accordance with the uh, uh, NRC standards a failure to establish adequate procedures required for fire protection program implementation, 
caused compensatory measures, the program implementation caused compensatory measures, fire watches, to not be adequately completed and could have potentially compromised the ability to safely shut down the plant in the event of a fire in any of the fire zones where the fire watches were required. Maybe you, Region 2, maybe you ought to give this up to these boys up in D.C. They probably would appreciate it since this has to be something that is not on their radar screen. And my comments will be in writing and I will send them in to the appropriate place. Thank you.